Good morning. morning. Welcome in Jesus' name to our worship service. It's good to be with you today after being gone last week on vacation. It's great to be back together, gathered here to worship the Lord. Um, Some announcements as we begin our service today. Um, If you take a look at our schedule for this coming week, just a reminder that after the service today, we have a missions committee meeting. Uh, If you're interested in in missions around the world, you're welcome to come and, and participate. We'd love to have you join us, and we'll, let's see, or Bill, where are we going to meet? All right, one, one of the Sunday school classrooms just in the new addition part is where uh, the meeting will take place. So you're welcome to join us. That'll be uh, just shortly after the service today. Um, this coming Wednesday, 7 o'clock in the morning, our men's uh, band of brothers meets. And then on Saturday at 9.30, the women's Bible study and fellowship Uh, will take place here at church as well. Um, In your bulletin, you'll notice that we've got some some numbers printed. It'd be below our prayer list. I just want to draw your attention to those today as we would praise God for his provision in this past year, which has been a very different year, and it certainly has impacted churches and ministries and charities and Uh, Everyone really has been impacted financially because of uh, this past year, but you'll notice that our income is within 500 bucks of our budget and our expenses were under our income. So we are so thankful to the Lord for uh, his provision uh, financially. Also, our our building addition project, it's not only done, but we've closed off the books on that too. And you'll notice that uh, the actual cost came in uh, quite a bit below what was approved. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think the building committee projected within $5,000 what they thought it would end up being. So they did a pretty swell job uh, predicting that as well. So we we thank God for his provision. Um, If you didn't grab your church directory that's available on a table in the, en- in the fellowship hall near the entrance. Uh, I encourage you to grab that. Um, if you're not in the directory but would like a copy yet, there are some uh, copies available for you as well. I think starting this next week, we'll probably start uh, mailing them out to those who have not been able to uh, pick them up yet. Are there any other announcements that we should highlight uh, here this morning? All right, if not, we look at Psalm 106, verse 48, for our call to worship. I will need you to participate at some point. I think you will know when. But Psalm 106, 48 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Very good, praise the Lord. I'll invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn, O God, our help. In ages past, I think we can all agree that our help for this coming year is in God, not in any man or woman, politician. Our help is in God. Let's sing.
Please remain standing as we would join together in reciting the Ten Commandments. And I should just point out, too, I should have done this during announcements, the uh, January edition of the Lutheran Ambassador, a magazine published by our denomination, uh, is available uh, just uh, next to the bulletin board outside the Fellowship Hall. And there's a, a variety of articles with the theme focusing on the Ten Commandments for the month of January. So I'd encourage you to grab a copy there. And let's join together now as we would recite the Ten Commandments. This is God's good and gracious will for our lives. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his cattle, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You may be seated. Father, we would pray today that you would forgive us for our sins, Lord, as we would have just recited the Ten Commandments. We see that we have not loved you above all things, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves. And so, Lord, even in the quietness of these moments, we would ask for your forgiveness for our sins. Lord, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And Lord, we need the cleansing that is available to us because of Jesus, who died on the cross and rose again in victory. So Lord, cleanse us. And Lord, may our worship be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 61. And you'll notice in our, our message later today that, that Jesus read from this passage, and so we want to take a look at these words here leading up to the message. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. If you have any prayer concerns today that you'd like uh, prayer for, maybe some answered prayers, some praises you'd like to, to, to thank God for, I'd love to have you feel uh, comfortable and, and free to share that with us today. I would direct you to our, our prayer list in the bulletin, uh, some things we want to be in prayer for here today. Um, pray for the, the Knorr family with uh, uh, Pastor Don passing away last Monday, uh, his Funeral is scheduled for tomorrow. It's going to be a private uh, funeral service for family only at the funeral home here in town. Uh, they're hoping to make a, a live stream arrangement available. Um, I will send an email uh, if that is able to, to happen and so that you are able to get in on that. But uh, be in prayer for the Knorr family during this time. Also pray for uh, John and Debbie's grandson, Jordan. He had a knee surgery this past week. And if you're on our email list, you would have also gotten uh, the prayer alert to pray for uh, Debbie's grandson, Dylan. He was in a dirt biking accident and has injury, uh, injuries to his spleen, also to his kidney. Um, I, I think in my email, I, I used the wrong word. I said he ruptured his spleen. It, he actually fractured it. There's a difference. If you're in the medical community, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, pray for him that... Uh, uh, for healing for his body uh, during this time. Uh, he's down at HCMC uh, in the Twin Cities. Also, we want to be in prayer for uh, those who have headed south for the winter. I think we have a few less going this year than normal years, but, but pray for those who 
even this past week, have traveled down there that uh, the Lord would watch over them and bring them back safely to us uh, later this spring. Um, also, we should pray for our country. I don't think I need to say much about that. You're probably not here because you want politics anyway, but we need to pray for our country uh, during this time of turmoil. Also, our missionaries of the month, Todd and Barb Shearcolt, uh, they are serving in Mexico. They are uh, back, thankfully. They, they also, along with many of our missionaries, were not able to uh, spend much of last year in the country because of, because of COVID, but they are back now, and so we want to remember them in our prayers today as well. Any other prayer concerns that you would like to uh, share with us today? Any updates on things we've been praying for? Marley? I think it's important to pray for our country and unity. And... Yes, yes, unity for our country, certainly. I know some have made the comment, I don't think we've ever been as divided as we are today. And those of you that have been around longer than I have a much broader history to draw from, and I think you're, you're right in saying that we are probably more divided now than we have, have ever been. Anything else that you'd like for prayer today? All right, let's uh, bow before the Lord. Father, we are so thankful that that we can count on your presence with us as we've entered this new year. Lord, we have no idea what's in store for us, just as we had no idea what was in store for us last year. But Lord, we know that you are our help, just as you have been the help of your people throughout the centuries. And Father, we would pray today for our country. We pray for, for unity, for calm heads, for revival, especially, Lord, for our country. Oh, how we need people to turn back to you and, and to come to know uh, Christ in, in a real and, and living way, to trust in him. And so, Father, we pray for that. Help us as a church family here to, to, to live in a way that is honoring of you. Help us to be salt and light within our community. Help us, Lord, to be those who would, who, who would seek unity and peace and, and not be causes of division. Father, help our, our leaders too, Lord, with the transition too of leadership taking place. We pray, O oh Lord, that, that it would be smooth and we pray that you would uh, give our leaders wisdom, help them to do what is right, regardless of how popular that may or may not be among the people. Father, we pray for our, our missionaries and especially today for Todd and Barb as they're serving in Mexico. Thank you for their many years of ministry there and, and Lord, we pray that you would bless them that they would continue to see fruit for their labors. Thank you that they're able to be back in the country. Lord, grant them safety. And we pray, O oh Lord, that many souls would come to know Christ as a result of their ministry there. Father, for those who are going through uh, times of, of grief, Lord, we pray for the Knorr family as, as Pastor Don is, uh, has passed away. Lord, we know, we know he's with you, no doubt about that. And yet their sadness, Lord, is... We've lost a friend, Lord, as the Knorr family has lost a, a, a dear family member. And so, Lord, we pray for comfort and peace for all who mourn. Father, we pray for healing, too, for those who have had um, surgeries or injuries recently. We pray for Jordan as he would recover from, from knee surgery. We also pray for Dylan, too, as he's hospitalized with injuries from his accident. Lord, give the doctors wisdom, and, and we pray, O oh Lord, that he could soon... Uh, recover well enough to be home, but Lord, we just pray that you continue to watch over him and encourage him. Lord, for uh, those who have gone south for the winter, Lord, we pray that you'd watch over them. For those who would perhaps be going south later too, we pray that you'd give them safe travels, not only there, but also back. And Lord, we're just thankful for the opportunity that we have to be together here today. And we pray that our service today would honor and glorify you we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite the kids to come now for our children's message. If you can gather up here in the front row. I'm going to grab our altar Bible here, which weighs about 18 pounds, it feels like. Imagine if you brought this Bible to church every day. You want to feel how heavy this is? What do you think about that? Too heavy. All right. 
It's amazing how light the Bible can be if it's on your phone, right? Yeah. So, I, oh, you want to feel it too? It's pretty heavy. Whoa. Can't even keep it up. I told you it's about 18 pounds. At least it feels that way. You know what I'm going to do? It's so heavy, I'm going to set it down for a minute, okay? But I brought this Bible off the altar today because we're going to ha- talk about a story where Jesus was handed the scriptures to do the scripture reading in the synagogue when he was there one day. Now, Jesus had grown up in the city of Nazareth, and he had come back home, and and he was going to do the scripture reading for that day. So here's what he did. He stood up, and someone came and handed him the scriptures. Now, the Bible, this altar Bible is turned right now in the book of Psalms, But um, we need to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, because that's the exact scripture that Jesus read when he was in the synagogue on that day. Let me just say, the synagogue was a place where Jewish people would meet for worship and reading the scriptures and being instructed in in what God, uh, the messages that God had given to his people over the years. So Jesus was handed the scriptures, and he read Isaiah 61, which I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it starts out by saying, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news. And he kept reading, and then guess what he did when he was done? He gave the scriptures back to the attendant, and he sat down. Now, after he sat down, He wasn't done. Tyler, pay attention. What was common in the synagogue is that you would stand for reading the scripture, and then you'd go sit down. And the one who read the scripture after sitting down, if they wanted to to comment on anything or, or have any kind of teaching, they would do it sitting down. So when Jesus sat down, guess what? Everyone kind of like now, was looking at him, wondering what would he say. After Jesus sat down and everyone was looking at him, Jesus said, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, what Jesus was saying was that this scripture reading is actually talking about me. That's what he was trying to tell the people. Here, you, you can be with me, okay? He said, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So he was saying, this is actually about me. Now, Jesus went on to teach these people and to teach a lot of other people that he was the son of God who had come into this world, that he was actually the promised Messiah. And as he taught people, what ended up happening is Some of the people initially liked Jesus. They thought, wow, you know, he's a really interesting teacher. I like listening to him. But as time went on, some of the people started to not like him so much because they didn't like some of the things that he was saying and teaching. Now, now remember, everything Jesus taught the people was true and right. And so some of the people who didn't like what Jesus taught, they had the problem, not Jesus. They didn't want to accept what Jesus taught. And so some of the people rejected Jesus. Now, Jesus did a bunch of amazing things, too. He would heal people who were blind and couldn't hear and couldn't walk. He would cast out demons. He did amazing things. So a lot of people were like, man, this guy's pretty amazing. He's exciting. He's a good teacher. And so they liked him for a while. And then some people started to turn against him, and they didn't like him. Well, going back to the day when he was in the synagogue and he he did the reading, then he sat down and he he started to talk with the people, he pointed out to them, you know what, some of you, you're not going to like me after a while. You might like me now, but you you aren't going to like me moving forward. And guess what? They got so mad at what Jesus said to them that day in the synagogue that they took him out of the synagogue They led him to a cliff. Their city was built up on a hill. They led him to a cliff, and they were going to throw him off the cliff to kill him. 
That's how angry they got. Of course, that's exactly what Jesus had said would happen, right? That, that they would end up kind of turning on him and not like him. But guess what? They did not succeed in throwing Jesus off the cliff. I don't know exactly what happened. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was able to pass through their midst and go on his way. I think something miraculous happened there where they were ready and, and, and ready to throw him off the cliff. But Jesus somehow, I think he worked out some sort of miracle that they were not able to actually do anything and he was able to just walk away. And here's a crowd gathered at a cliff so angry that they were ready to try to kill Jesus. And Jesus had grown up in their town. But you see, there's a lot of people whether it was people in Nazareth or other people in Israel or even people today who will reject Jesus because there's something about him they don't like. You know, as Jesus taught people, he would teach people, this is good and pleasing in God's sight. This is stuff you should not do. And some of the people who were doing some of the stuff that they shouldn't have been doing, when Jesus came and said, hey, you shouldn't live that way, that's wrong. You need to repent of your sins. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to change, so they thought, I hate this Jesus now. And they wanted to get rid of him. But what we learn in Scripture, Jesus is the Son of God and the promised Messiah. He's the only one who can save us from our sin. And what he teaches us is always right and true. And following Jesus, trusting in him at all times, will always be worth it. Always. Now, we're going to talk more about that here in just a minute. But you can imagine what kind of a, a, a day that was in the synagogue. People came probably having no idea what they were going to see, you know, in church that day. They had no idea that Jesus would say and do what he did. And they probably had no idea that there'd be this crowd trying to throw a man off a cliff after the service. It was a a day that I'm sure many of them never forgot. Well, thanks for listening so well. You can head back to your seats. And I'll get our 18-pound Bible back up on the altar. Any guesses on what chapter we usually keep the book open to? John 3.16. Oh, we're much too centered. Can you see that? It's in the Psalms, yep. Psalm 119 is where we often have it kept, which is a pretty good chapter to have it on because there's a real emphasis on God's word in Psalm 119. For example, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Well, let's talk about high school homecomings. <laughs> Those things probably didn't happen Almost anywhere this year would be my guess. And if they did, it was probably like virtual or something weird like that. But in normal years, high school homecomings are a, a, a common annual tradition, right? Most of the time, they're held in the fall, often in connection with like a football game on a Friday night. I'm guessing most of you would probably raise your hand and say, yep, that's kind of how we did it, right? But the, these high school homecomings... You know, they're meant to be like a welcome back party for alumni. They're, they're meant to be an opportunity for people to show their hometown pride. Of course, you, you hope you got an easy football team to play that night so that you can win your homecoming game. You know, it's a chance for people to get reacquainted. Some people who come back maybe feel like, yep, this is why I don't live here anymore, depending on their experience with that town and, and that high school. But homecomings can be some, some special times for people. Well, we're going to look at a, a, a story in the scriptures where Jesus came back to his hometown of Nazareth. And what an interesting thing that turned out to be. An unforgettable experience. Now, before we look at Luke chapter 4, I just want to remind you that, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem which was in the, the more southern part of Israel, about five miles south of Jerusalem. But he grew up in Nazareth, which was in the more northern part of Israel, in, in the region called Galilee. 
And just prior to his return to Nazareth, we read that Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And we see that as, as the, the beginning of his public ministry. So he had been baptized by John the Baptist. He had also been tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And so those two events had just taken place before Jesus came back to Nazareth, which was his hometown. And at this point, at this homecoming, so to speak, Jesus' popularity was on the rise. People were beginning to hear about him, and, and it was a positive thing. People thought, wow, you know, he's, he's quite the teacher. We, you know, we kind of like this guy, this Jesus of Nazareth. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 4. We're going to pick it up at verse 14 and read through verse 30. Uh, the title of this message is An Unforgettable Homecoming, and it's part of a series that we're starting today called Jesus Really Did That? All right? It's going to be interesting. So reading then from Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. It says, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him, and were wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, Gentile country, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in, in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove Jesus out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. As we take a, a closer look at this story today, there are three uh, just very brief statements that will guide our study. First of all, we want to consider Isaiah's prophecy. And, and certainly in, in reading this passage, you know Jesus read from a certain prophecy out of the book of Isaiah. If your Bible is open and you look with me at verse 16, this verse points out that it was Jesus' custom, his normal practice of attending the synagogue on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day. And of course, knowing his upbringing, uh, knowing the character of Joseph and Mary, it's no surprise that that was his custom. In other words, it was his normal practice to go to church every week, okay? So Jesus is back in Nazareth, and he goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. The synagogue was an important location within the Jewish communities. It was a place where they would gather for worship and instruction. They would be taught the scriptures. And it was, a, it was also a very, um, it was kind of like the community center of a, 
of, of the place as well. It was a very important place in the life of Jewish people. And so Jesus is there, back in Nazareth, he's there in the synagogue, and he does the scripture reading for the day. He was handed the book or the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Now, I don't know which is the correct answer. Did Jesus read the passage that was assigned for that day? Or did Jesus turn to chapter 61 because he knew what he wanted to say to the people? I'm not sure which, uh, which is correct. If it happened to be the scripture reading for that day, well, certainly we believe that God was arranging things to be that way so that Jesus could say, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Maybe Jesus was given the book of the prophet Isaiah and it was up to him where he wanted to turn and read. But he specifically went to what we call chapter 61. And what an incredible prophecy it was. If you look again at verses 18 and 19, if you can picture Jesus standing, everyone else seated, and Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. What an incredible prophecy for Jesus to read. This is what we could call a double fulfillment prophecy. Because in the context of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, in the context, you can see a more immediate fulfillment that the prophet Isaiah would have been referencing, and it had to do with Israel's deliverance from captivity in Babylon. And so in this poetic language, you could see how this more immediate fulfillment of release from captivity in Babylon could be connected to this passage. But Jesus makes it clear that this passage ultimately has to do with him. And we often find this throughout Old Testament prophetic writings. It's a double fulfillment. There's something that can be connected more immediate, more within the time frame of the people who are receiving the prophecy, but then there's also something later and greater about the prophecy that is connected with the Messiah. Remember that prophecy about how a virgin would conceive and give birth to a son? That's a double fulfillment prophecy as well. There was a more immediate fulfillment that could be pointed to, but there's a later greater fulfillment in Christ. And so Jesus reads this prophecy and then says something amazing. So we got, first of all, Isaiah's prophecy. Second, Jesus' declaration. Now, when Jesus, what Jesus did after reading this passage, I'm sure was a great surprise to everyone who was gathered there at the synagogue that day. What did he do? He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Now, I mentioned to the kids already earlier in the service that it was the normal thing to do in the synagogue for the person who's going to do the scripture reading to stand up and read it in the presence of all the people and then go sit down. And if there were any comments or instruction that was going to come, you would do it sitting down. That was the normal thing to do. And so everything seemed to be going normally in the service until Jesus sits down and begins to speak again. I'm sure that no one was expecting to hear what came out of Jesus' mouth. Jesus declares that today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus is connecting himself to this prophecy. He's saying that ultimately these words are speaking about me. And this prophecy then serves as an explanation of the Messiah's ministry, what the Messiah had come to do. Ultimately, Jesus came to provide deliverance, spiritual deliverance to those who are captives to sin, to those who are in the grips of sin and its eternal consequences. And yes, Jesus would literally heal the blind, and, and heal those who could not hear. He would heal those who could not walk. He would cast out demons. He would provide that kind of deliverance as well to those who are suffering the physical effects of living in a broken world. 
But ultimately, Jesus came to provide spiritual deliverance, freedom to those who are in the grips of sin, freedom to those who will suffer the eternal consequences of sin unless the Lord delivers them. That's why Jesus came, to provide reconciliation between a perfectly holy God and broken, sinful man. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to bring true joy and peace to all who would believe in him. And when we read from Isaiah 61 earlier for our scripture reading, you got a sense from verse 2 into verse 3, the, the joy, the gladness that was being spoken of. When you come to know Jesus as your Savior, there is joy and peace in your heart because you know that your sins have been paid for, that you have a right relationship with the God who created you and to whom you are accountable for how you live your life. When you know that through faith in Jesus you have everything you need to have a right relationship with God, there is joy and peace to be found. And that's why Jesus came. To reconcile sinful man with a holy God. So how would the people respond? How did the people of Nazareth respond? That's our third point, the people's response. Well, I think we can describe it as going from Hometown pride to hatred. We saw from reading this that the people initially were pretty excited about Jesus. I mean, look again with me at verse 14 and 15. We're told that as Jesus returned to Galilee, the region in which Nazareth was located, that news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in the synagogues and was praised by all. So Jesus returns, he's doing teaching, and people are excited about this guy, right? And, and, and we notice in verse 22 that people are, that, that the people were wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. They were speaking well of him, and they're asking a question, right? Is this not Joseph's son? In other words, it's like, wow, this is quite the guy considering where he came from. Joseph was not some well-educated teacher so that you could say, well, like father, like son, right? If anything, the people were a little bit surprised. Isn't this Joseph's son? And, and look at him now. And they were excited by him. They thought he was quite good. We like this guy. Now, verse 22 is really interesting because of its location within the story, okay? So we got verse 14 and 15 kind of introduces us to what's coming. You know, Jesus returns home. He goes to the synagogue, right? It tells us he read the scripture. He said, today it's fulfilled in your hearing. After verse 22, the story continues with what Jesus said to them and how they responded. But you got verse 22, which is, seems to be in a strange spot in the passage. It seems to completely interrupt the story, doesn't it? Because what does verse 22 say in between, today this has been fulfilled, and no doubt you'll say to me, physician, heal yourself? It says that all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? I think that this verse, verse 22, is like a parenthetical comment. It's kind of inserted right in the middle of the story to remind us of how quickly the people went from hometown pride. Man, we like Jesus. Look at this. This is pretty amazing. He's kind of putting Nazareth on the map. Hometown pride to hatred. Almost like that. People speaking well of him, wondering at his gracious words, thinking, man, is this really Joseph's son? And yet... They go from hometown pride to hatred, just like that. Now, part of the reason why they got so upset with Jesus be, is because of what Jesus went on to say in verses 23 and following. If you want to turn there again in your Bible, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Jesus made some pretty pointed accusations to those who were gathered there in the synagogue that day. It, it wasn't, they weren't the most gracious words, were they? But they were true. 
Look at verse 23. Jesus said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. So this was a, a common saying then among the day. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Jesus is pointing out that they would end up selfishly wanting him to put on a show on command. You did all these amazing things there. What about us? Come on, do it here. Do it now. You heal people there? Come on, heal people right here now. They would end up taking upon themselves a selfish attitude, wanting Jesus to put on a show whenever they asked it. Jesus points that out. This is what you're going to end up doing. And they didn't like hearing that. Verse 24, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. They wouldn't be willing to hear some of the difficult things that Jesus would end up saying. The Lord's prophets often had to deliver difficult messages. And that's why there was that saying, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. We like you as long as you keep saying things that make us happy. Don't accuse us of anything. Don't bring a difficult message to us. That's why no prophet is welcome in his hometown, as Jesus points out. But the Lord's prophets often had to deliver difficult messages. And so they often were not accepted and embraced within their hometown. But we see that kind of a thing going on today, too. And it's rather strange when it happens, but hey, think about it. People often don't accept difficult messages from those to whom they are close. Think about a marriage relationship. Husbands and wives often don't accept constructive criticism from one another, right? And some of you are looking at each other now. But you'll be more accepting of the same criticism from someone else, right? You know what I'm talking about. And that can happen too within, you know, within marriage, within family, within the workplace. It can happen within churches too. You know, I could, I could offer some critique of our, our setting here and something we need to do better. And you might be like, how dare he think we can improve on anything, right? And then someone else could say the same thing and you'd be accepting of it. That happens in churches too. No prophet is welcome in his hometown, Jesus pointed out. Now, look with me at verse 25 and through 27. Then Jesus points out some historical examples. And what does he say? I tell you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when there was this great famine. And there were many, okay, but Elijah was sent to none of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon, uh, to a woman who was a widow. So Elijah came and did something really special for someone who was not a Jewish person. Verse 27, there were many lepers, but who was healed? A Syrian general named Naaman. What Jesus is pointing out here is that they would end up not liking the fact that his ministry included Gentiles. There was this real kind of an ugly pride among the Jewish people in his day. They thought it was all about them. God only cared about them. Why would you bother going and interacting with Gentiles and, and, and calling them to be part of the kingdom? It's about us and us only. And so Jesus is pointing out, look, not only will you end up selfishly wanting me to do miraculous things on command, not only will you be unwilling to hear difficult messages from me, but you're also going to be unwilling to accept the fact that Gentiles are included as well. And so what was their response? We need to kill this guy. We need to kill this son of Joseph. Verse 28, uh, excuse me, verse 30 points out then. Nope, 28, I was right, sorry. Verse 28 points out that the people in the synagogue who were there that day were filled with rage. Now remember verse 14 and 15 and verse 22. They were praise, you know, speaking praise of Jesus. They were excited by him. They were liking him. And here they are, filled with rage. They drive Jesus out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. 
just like that. They went from hometown pride to hatred. Now I pointed out verse 30 to the kids. It says, passing through their midst, Jesus went on his way. Now, I don't really know what to say about what that looked like, but I think something miraculous happened in that moment. Something really unusual. For there to be a crowd of people who had dragged Jesus from the synagogue over to the cliff, ready to throw him down, and that didn't actually happen, something weird happened. And I think it was a miracle. There had to have been something about Jesus' demeanor or something where they could not follow through on what they wanted to do. Somehow, he passed through their midst and went on his way. I don't know what it looked like, but I think it was a miracle. And I imagine it left some of them who are standing there watching thinking, whoa, who is this? Is this really Joseph's son? As we wrap things up, I want to point out that although this event took place about 2,000 years ago, this event challenges people of any century to consider their response to Jesus. If Jesus of Nazareth really is the Son of God and the promised Messiah, and He is, then the only appropriate response is, is to trust in Him and to follow Him and, and to obey Him in all things, regardless of the cost. If He really is who He claimed to be, then that's the only appropriate response. He's not the kind of guy where you can like Him and pick and choose what you want and discard what you want. He's not that kind of person. The call is to trust in Him and follow Him and obey Him in all things, regardless of the cost. But the mindset of many people in Nazareth and in Israel and the mindset of many people today is, well, yeah, I, I kind of like Jesus. As long as he always makes me happy and comfortable and, and, and never says anything that contradicts what I already think and believe about everything in life. If Jesus is that kind of a guy, then yes, I like him. He's pretty amazing as long as he always makes me happy and comfortable, as long as his teaching never challenges what I already think and believe about whatever it may be in this world. Many people like Jesus until they're confronted with some other things. I want to leave you with this thought. Following Jesus isn't always easy. And Jesus made that clear. Following Jesus isn't always easy, but it's always worth it. Always. Let's close with prayer. Lord, we are thankful that we have the scriptures to look into today. Lord, we're thankful that you have so graciously revealed yourself to us, that you sent your Son into this world to come and deliver us from sin and death and the power of the devil. And thank you, Lord, that forgiveness and eternal life, a right relationship with you, the hope of heaven, that all of this is ours simply through faith in Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our faith in him that you would help us, O oh Lord, to walk and to follow him all the days of our lives. And help us, Lord, to be willing to accept the difficult things that Jesus would say. Help us, Lord, not to look for a, a Jesus who only makes us happy and comfortable. Help us, O oh Lord, to follow him regardless of the cost. Help us to remember that it is always worth it to follow him. Help us, O oh Lord, to keep growing closer to you. 
And thank you, Lord, that as we, as we keep following Jesus and walking close to him, that we are in the very best place that we could ever be, no matter what's going on in the world around us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we would come to the Lord's Supper, I'll invite you to stand as we sing a, a, a wonderful hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. <clears throat> In our hymnal, there's two different tunes to sing this hymn. From my growing up experience, this was always the other tune. So I'm not sure what your experience is. Maybe this was the normal tune and the other one was the other tune. But whatever tune you're familiar with, let's sing. My hope is built on nothing less. May our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, whose holy body and blood you have now received, strengthen your assurance that your sins are forgiven and preserve you in the one true faith unto everlasting life. Go and serve your Savior with joy. Amen. And I'll invite you to stand as we close our service by singing the doxology. Mm -hmm. 